On the opening day, Sirauji greeted the yogis, and in following days, Sirauji has spoken in the order uh, that the Buddha usually followed, uh, called progressive speech, Anupobi Kata. The Buddha would start with good deeds that are easy to do and then go from there to speak about gradually higher and higher level types of good deeds. When one studies, one starts out by learning the alphabet and from there one learns to spell words, read words, and then make short sentences longer sentences, and bit by bit, one one becomes skilled in reading. So among good deeds, or kusala, which make our life clean, dana, or generosity, is the easiest. And when the Buddha met with beings, he would start with speaking about this easy type of good deed. Seeing how the Buddha spoke progressively about kusala, good deeds going from easy to more and more high level, Sirauji has been speaking in the same manner as he gives the audience the Dhamma gift. And so in the first days, Sirauji has spoken about the purifying deed of dana, generosity, or dana, punya, and also the, the purifying deed of morality, sila, ponya. If we do dana in a thorough way, there's no need to act for us to wish or ask for any special results from it because it becomes the basis for our happiness. How is this? If we do dana, generosity, act of giving, that is free of attachment to the thing that we are giving, without any expectation for return, without any desire to become famous as someone who can give, then this act of giving is free of selfish greed. And this type of giving, or dana, because it is free of selfish greed, is very high level. So when we add to this loving-kindness or the desire for other people's welfare, then there won't be any hatred. And when we add compassion, the wish for others to be relieved of suffering, then one will be free of cruelty. So this type of dana is very good. When one can't control one's mind, then extreme greed causes us to do wrongful acts for our own selfish interest, to take what doesn't belong to, to us, to, um, to take things of all types, to steal, to commit adultery, and so on, to lie for our own benefit. And also when anger is out of control, we go to the extent of harming others we uh, lie in order to harm others, we steal in order to harm others. So when we do dana in a systematic way, then we don't fall and we don't give in to these tendencies because when we're doing dana systematically, we establish loving kindness and compassion as as, as part of our doing dana, the wish for others to be well and, and the feeling of compassion for them. So when we add to this the knowledge of what is beneficial to do and what is not beneficial to do, what is suitable and what is not suitable to do, 
then this is like being able to drive a car, keeping within our lane, knowing the rules of the road, reducing speed when we go around curves, when we come to, when we intersection, when we come to an intersection with a green light, we can go ahead. When we come to an intersection and the light is yellow, then we should proceed with caution. And when there's a red light, we should come to a stop. This is what the, the knowledge of what is beneficial and suitable is like. And when this knowledge is involved with our act of giving, then because we know how to do dana, the dana we do is very excellent. And people who uh, have this knowledge of what is beneficial and not, what is suitable and not, what is not, are able to control their greed and anger easily. So although dana is not a part of morality, it's not included within sila, but it is a cause for us learning how to keep sila. That type of dana is the root cause for happiness, the type of happiness that people like. And this is true because when one does dana systematically, then metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, unselfishness, all these are present. So for such a person who's developed this habit, it's easy to refrain from acts such as killing, stealing, and adultery. So if when we are doing dana, we make ourselves free of extreme loba, greed, extreme dosa, anger, extreme moha, delusion, then this dana becomes the basis for us to keep sila, keep morality, basic good morality. And from there, one has the desire to keep one's mind clean. That is to not just uh, be free of acts of killing and stealing, but to be free of the desire to kill, to be free of the desire to the mental tendency to steal or commit adultery, lie, take drugs. So because of one's basis in, in loving kindness and compassion, one then uh, works to develop a clean mind by developing the training of concentration, by putting one's mind onto a single object so that it is focused. So in this way, dana is the root cause for us doing the good deed of developing the training of concentration. And from here, having gained the basis in concentration, one works to develop knowledge. So in this way, dana is also um, involved as a, as a cause that leads to us developing knowledge. And that's why it's said in the text that this dana is the root cause of all types of happiness. Systematic dana is, brings about happiness on many levels. And if we perform dana, then the result is that we have enough materially when we're born in the human realm and we've done dana in the past, then we have enough to eat, we have enough clothes to wear, we have enough to live on, and therefore we don't feel inferior because we have enough materially. And for us then, it's easy for us to keep morality. And with sila as our base, then it's easy to develop a stable mind, to control the mind, and from there to develop knowledge. So therefore, although dana generosity is not considered part of 
moral training. It's not part of sila, but it is a cause for happiness to arise. And if we're going to do dana, it's something that we should do well. When we do dana that is uh, with a mind that is free of extreme greed, hatred, and delusion, and our physical and verbal behavior are clean, then we are able to live like a true human being. And because we have enough materially, it is easy for us to keep the five precepts. Therefore, dana is the cause for us to be able to keep the five precepts. With a basis in sila, if we work to develop the jhanas, we can then, uh, on rebirth, we can gain a lifetime in the Brahma world. So, uh, and if dana, we, if we perform dana, in addition to sila, keeping good basic human morality, the result of that is that if we are born in the human world, we can become leaders, we can become rulers, we can become rich people, we can be at the higher levels of society. And for those who have a foundation in dana and sila, and enter the monastic life, for example, one can become a noble person. One can even become an arahant. So uh, when we do dana, that, that, that results in us having enough materially. And having enough materially, it's easy for us to keep sila. And these are the first two of the paramis, it's easy then to go from there to fulfill the remaining paramis or perfections. So when one fulfills the paramis, then one is able to gain the type of life one wants. So that's why it's also said that dana is the root cause for fulfillment. When one wants, one who wants a fulfilled life should perfect dana. And for, but first of all, one must keep good sila so that one is truly human. In whatever lifetimes occur, this type of dana, because one, to the extent that one has the desire that other people be fulfilled, that their needs be, be fulfilled, if one has that type of intention when one gives, then this intention, or chedana, brings us fulfillment of material, in material ways, poga sampati. So this means, uh, in terms of a place to live, clothing, food, possessions, dana brings, the, our intention in doing dana brings about this type of this type of material uh, result. And this is, um, our dana supports gaining materially. So um, it's a strong support for us to, for us to have material possessions. So being fulfilled materially means that we don't have any need to feel inferior. And being in this type of situation is the work of dana, is the work of the generous acts that we've done. So it's said that dana is something which saves us. It's like a, uh, it's like a savior in a way. And that's a saying. And to the extent, what happens is that to the extent our intention or chedana is good when we do dana, this doesn't go to waste. It's not for nothing. Our strong 
intention, wholesome intention, makes the results of our dana even better. So when we want the other people, the person, the recipient, to be free of suffering, uh, when we don't have expectation for re good results for ourselves. You know, before we give something, we cut off our attachment to that thing, and we have in mind the other person's welfare. While we're giving the act, we're also, uh, we also have these good qualities in mind. So this type of dana is what, um, it does, this type of intention that, is, that takes place both as we get ready to do the dana and while we're giving the gift itself, they, um, this intention bears fruit. It makes us full, it makes us, it brings us good results. And these, the good results that we experience aren't brought about by any god. They're not brought about, about by Saka, the king of the gods. They're not brought about by Allah or by any type of uh, other being. It's our own intention that creates the results we experience. And to understand this is the right view of kama as our own property, kama sakata samadeti. That, that is the understanding that one's actions with intention bring results for better or for worse. And for, for human beings, this understanding of karma and its results is extremely important. Everyone on this planet, for everyone, it's very important to have the understanding that our actions are our own property. And the reason for this is that this knowledge is like a junction. The understanding that wholesome physical, verbal, and mental, um, mental actions bring about good results, whereas things done, said, or planned, and so on with bad intention bring about bad results. With this understanding, then we will choose the things that bring good results. So this basic, this is a, a basic understanding from which paths branch out. So for one who wants to be a true human being, then one avoids misdeeds either through shame and fear regarding doing things like killing, stealing, and so on, or th through an understanding of how these things feel to other people. And that is what we do if we want to be truly human. If we don't avoid these actions, killing, stealing, and so on, then our morality becomes broken and other people are harmed. And even in the present life, we can experience, we experience the bad results of this, let alone any, uh, any future lifetime. One who commits such acts, killing, stealing, and so on, is no longer considered human. And on the other hand, if we avoid these acts, it's very good. So what makes the difference is the understanding that when we do good, say good, plan good things, it brings good results. When we, Likewise, when we do say, plan bad things, they bring bad results. So the, this understanding of kama as our own property is, makes the difference. If our morality is complete, then if we keep morality without breaking it, then we'll be free of coarse, wild behavior and we'll be truly human. So this is how 
when we are able to do dana, it becomes easy for us to keep sila. With the basic knowledge, with this knowledge as a basis that killing, stealing, these acts are base and low, knowing this one avoids them. And then one's actions and speech become suitable. They become free of blame. And the nearest cause for us to keep good moral behavior, avoid these misdeeds, is the understanding that if we do these things, it's shameful. If we do these things, it's fearful to acts such as killing and stealing. So this is the nearest cause for us to undertake sila. And with, with the um, qualities of shame and fear regarding um, immoral deeds, regarding harming others, then we control ourselves. And therefore we don't cause any harm to others. So this is quite good. So if basic morality is not present, then in one's life, uh, it's as though a bad smell starts to uh, come out of oneself. Not keeping good morality makes people disgusting as though they smell very bad. But on the other hand, if we keep sila, it's like a very fragrant smell that, uh, and, how should I say? It also, um, it's like a, a good fragrance that people notice and comment about. So it's said that sila is like a fragrant smell and it's also like an ornament that makes one beautiful. It's the best ornament, the best type of um, thing to put on because no matter how well one is dressed, no matter how beautiful one's jewelry is, if one doesn't have moral behavior, then one won't be attractive at all. But with good morality, one looks good because of the morality. So it's said that sila makes the wearer, wearer beautiful. And people who keep sila don't go down to lower existences when they're reborn. So not keeping sila, one, one will go to lower realms of rebirth where there's mostly suffering. But our sila keeps us from going down. One who bears it won't go down, won't fall. So therefore, sila is something that is very, a very good thing for us to rely on and we should keep good sila. From the point of understanding karma as our own property, kama sakata samadeti, paths diverge, paths branch out, and there's the path of dana punya, the purifying deed of generosity, which brings about material fulfillment. And then there's the path of sila punya, which brings us a lifetime in the human realm or the deva realm. So here we are, we're humans already, and we have enough to wear, enough to eat, we have a place to live. So we have performed these causes in the past. This, we, aren't, uh, we aren't without having done this having done these good deeds of dana and sila in the past. And if at this point in time, we continue to only do acts of generosity plus acts of morality, 
we will just break even. We'll just get back what we already have, which is a lifetime as a human with enough to eat and enough, to, enough materially. So this is like <clears throat> doing a business where we just break even. We just get back. Uh, all we have left is our capital at the end of the day. So that type of business is not worthwhile because if in, the, if in time our family needs something, then we have to dip into the capital. We don't have any profit to use, so we have to dip in into, into the capital to take care of our family's need. And in time, our family won't be able to survive. <clears throat> the capital will <clears throat> the capital will get eaten up. So So understanding this, we should see that doing Dana and Sila just give our give us back our original investment. They don't make any, us any profit. So how are we going to gain a profit? on our lives. We need to be able to do this. And sila, morality, is not enough. Sila is controlling our physical and verbal behavior. But we still need to be able to control the mind. Because <clears throat> otherwise we'll have thoughts of wanting to kill and so on. So in order to um, in order to make the mind clean, first of all, we have to build our mental energy. We have to make the mind clean and build up the mental energies so that the, the thoughts of wanting to kill or wanting to steal, commit adultery, lie, take drugs and intoxicants, these become very, very far away. So. We have to go from the basis of sila to working to make our mind clean. And that will make us able to have a human mentality. Our heart will be human. Sila makes us a true human being. But the training of concentration makes us able to keep our mind humane. So the yogis here, starting with the rising and the falling, observe every arising object by applying effort. And the application of effort to observe the arising object eliminates laziness. It doesn't let laziness arise. And laziness, as well as other unwholesome qualities, the first of them is laziness. And when our observation becomes steady on the object, then kilesas can't enter, defilements can't enter our mind. The mind becomes stable upon the object, and therefore it doesn't run away, it doesn't run anywhere. So these three qualities are what we develop as we apply effort to observe the arising object, starting with the rising and the falling. We have to try to do this many, many times, second after second. If in one second uh, we make a noting, then in 60 minutes, in 60 seconds, in one minute, there will be 60 times of making the mind, of developing these qualities of effort and the observing power and stability. So if these clean mind moments occur again and again consecutively, like in a line, then the tendencies, the, the, the thoughts of breaking sila, the thoughts of killing, stealing, and so on, become distant. And this is the meditation what the meditation we are doing is for. It is for controlling the mind. So think of how rope is made. Now we take one or two or three strands 
and we wind strands together of fiber. So these strands, each individual one is not very strong, but we wind one or two or three together and we wind them tightly so that the rope can be strong. So each individual strand doesn't have much, much strength in it. And if we pull apart the individual strands, we can break one of them. But when we put them together so that they're very tightly wound, and then we put another one and another one, with each additional strand that we wind together tightly, it, it becomes stronger and stronger. So the rope can become very strong. And it's similar when we're observing the objects. Right when the object arises, we observe it steadfastly, steadfastly. And each second that we do this, there's not much mental energy at all. But when one moment of observation follows another and another and another without a break so that there's no gap in between then the mind becomes very powerful and one will gain special results and one will come to cherish the results that come about by this continuous effort to apply the mind to observe the arising object 